today's talk is about a genuinely complex system. It's not an arbitrary up in the air complex system. It's a down to earth complex system. And it does, uh, it has <coughs> responded to very clever use of data and experimentation and so forth. So, um, yeah. So, uh, it, it's an experiment to use the word metadata when it comes to Fox, but it seems to fit. Um, what I want to make clear is, is that this talk is based on work that up until a year ago I knew almost nothing about, and it, to some it may seem nothing's changed. But <laughs> there is a ongoing multi-person experimental slash theoretical project uh, centered at the University of Michigan, but also includes people from NIH. Dr. Reed is here today. And, um, Sorry. It's organized by an incredibly energetic young person named Indika Rajapati. And <clears throat> so what I hope to do in this talk is to talk through some of the remarkable ways that people have used data to build models of systems that are seemingly too complex to think about. So, and, and I won't compare to everyone. I'm going to emphasize some things that if others were giving a talk in a similar area, they might not mention at all. But because I come to this from a mathematical modeling perspective, uh, I'll make them seem more important than they perhaps are. So, first thing I have to do is I have to, I'm assuming that only two people in the audience know what cellular reprogramming is. And that, uh, so I'm going to spend some time giving you a minimal background bridge between what I believe you to know and what you would need to know to appreciate the rest of the talk. And there are some remarkable features of the model that we're talking about here today, namely that there are a very large number of processes involved that uh, are periodic and highly non -human. So we're trying to simplify something and model something that we do not have any hopes of reusing to first principles. It's not going to be that eventually it's going to be two million first order differential equations with all the constants known. It's just not going to happen. So we're going to try to motivate and explain at the same time. So there are a couple good reasons for reprogramming a cell. What does programming a cell just at the first cut mean? What it means is that cells are purposed in the body, and sometimes they get repurposed by exposure to a carcinogen or to radiation or some other uh, insult, and they become cancerous. We might want to change them back to their um, happier state. That's one reason for trying to reprogram. It gives you a little bit of insight what programming might be. And another important possibility is that um, if you could, if one can, uh, reprogram, say, skin cells to become liver cells, then you might be able to uh, use that as a therapeutic for uh, restoring function to some parts of the body or growing new fingers or something of that nature. So, I want to be sure at the beginning that uh, you understand that we're not dealing with individual cells. And I mean, maybe in some cases it is possible 
but nothing like that's going to happen in this talk. We're dealing with colonies of cells. And I can't put in, this is putting in a little bit of a plug for some of my own work on uh, adapting control theory to the control of ensembles rather than individual units. And you see this showing up nowadays in the control of swarms and in control of quantum systems as an NMR. It's, just, it's absolutely the only way things get done. And if you want to think more broadly about population controls, it shows up there too. And what we'll be able to, when I first looked at problems like this in quantum mechanics, I said to myself, what the heck? We've got these atoms and molecules wandering around in every possible orientation, subject to thermal fluctuations, and all you can do is just blast a laser beam at them, or hit them with some electromagnetic radiation or a different frequency. What can you hope to do with such a broad <coughs> tool, such an unrefined tool, uh, and runs up against that same thing here? And generally speaking, what I'll be talking about is one of two sorts of problems. One of them is you have a mixed colony, say partly cancerous and partly healthy, and you put in an input that would try to accentuate the difference so that you can um, exploit that difference with some kind of uh, treatment. Another possibility is you have a more or less homogeneous colony, and you want to uh, amplify the small differences that occur there. And again, possibly for uh, some use like separation of the cells into subsets. OK, so the standard picture of proliferating cells. So as you might or might not know, uh, skin cells continue to divide throughout their life. But muscle cells do not. So muscle cells are, once they're there, they're there. But skin cells divide. I'm going to talk about division, not, not the kind of cells that are permanently there, but the cells that continue to divide. So when they divide, they go through a cycle. And it's uh, divided into stages, which involve growing uh, extra nuclear material, it involves eventually separating the nucleus, and eventually a physical division. This, this part of the cell is, is uh, this part of biology is quite well understood. At, at a certain level. Now, all the time that this is happening, and this may happen on a variety of cycles depending on the particular cell, but roughly you should think about this as something that happens over a 24-hour period. And here's a lovely picture from the web that starts off with a Nice happy cell here, starts dividing, emphasizing the distinction between the material that makes the nucleus and uh, the extra nuclear material, and back then at the end to a daughter cell that uh, looks more or less like the mother. <coughs> it's awkward language to talk about cells because they are transient. You say, what, how should I think about this? Well, it's like you should think about your family pedigree. It's not that uh, you are a Marcus today and you will cease to be a Marcus tomorrow, but there will be something called Marcus later on. And cells are a bit like that. So keep that in mind. Okay. Now, from a mathematical point of view, this is a whole new ballgame. You can look at periodic solutions in 
your favorite book on differential equations and tell you blue in the face, you will not find anything like this. So, the Earth goes around the sun and 365 days or so and it repeats itself. Suppose what happened was the Earth went around the sun and after 365 days and 11 minutes it became two Earths. Okay? So when people talk about the period of history when it comes to cells, they're talking about a process that's quite different than x double dot plus kx equals zero. Talking about something like a branching process in probability, whereas at every time a branch occurs, you get two copies, and the original one disappears. So. That's a little bit strange, and we don't have any standard uh, textbook treatment of such things. I think the closest thing is uh, when people started studying branching processes to understand nuclear fission in the 1940s, uh, they did some interesting calculations with uh, processes that branched like that. But there's nothing like that in the differential equations at the present time. However, there is a very <clears throat> rough analogy, namely that when the electric power grid gets into trouble because it was overloaded or something uh, fault happened, you do see an interconnected grid splitting up into two pieces like that. And you might begin to look about a mathematical theory of cell division by thinking about that uh, analogy that might possibly get you somewhere. I think if you come at it from this point of view, it's a little bit like determining the domain of attraction of a uh, equilibrium point. And in this instance, you would have something like a domain of attraction associated with these, this decoupled system. And you would be acting, asking yourself, how can I either stay away from that domain of attraction if you want to think of avoiding blackouts, or if you want to get to it for some other purpose. Uh, I believe this is a problem that one can make a little bit of progress on mathematically. Okay. Enough of that. So, features of what I'm saying here. The main thing is that there are about 200 different cell types in the human body, and I have just a few of them there. Um, there are, and the ones I've listed there are cells that are simply differentiated, that is to say, they know their purpose in life, they've passed through adolescence, and they have become something or other. However, there are also cells, stem cells, which are pluripotent. That is to say, they can do anything, potentially, uh, and they will eventually decide what it is they want to become through some processes and uh, become one of these differentiated cells. The point of it is, is that the stem cells and all the differentiated cells and so forth have the same DNA. What's different about them is therefore epigenetic. That is to say, DNA encompasses all of genetics, and these are different in some, in some other way, they, it's epigenetic. And I'm going to talk about that because that becomes key to what uh, the process of controlling the beta cells is. Again, for the purpose of people who are uh, not doing this every day, I think it's helpful to have a little vocabulary. 
transcription factors are going to be the controls that we have available to steer a cell to its ultimate fate. And you don't know what transcription factors are, perhaps. So I've built a little bit of an analogy here that might be helpful to you. So think about the DNA. It's, it never changes. Zips and unzips and reproduces itself, but the code that the DNA has never changes. So if you think about this in terms of a kitchen analogy, the DNA is like the cookbook. The cookbook never needs to change. The transcription factors are like bookmarks or um, paper clips that you put in the cookbook. And if you go to a paper clip, you'll see a recipe for pea soup, and you can make that. That book also contains a recipe for chicken soup, but the paper clip is on the pea soup page. You won't be making chicken soup. That's the thing. All right? Now, RNA, or messenger RNA, is like gathering the ingredients. The RNA will go out into the uh, cytoplasm of the cell and look around and be run into the ingredients that are particular to the recipe that is being made. So think of RNA as a gatherer. It goes out and gathers. <coughs> Producing, what's its purpose in gathering? Its purpose in gathering is to produce a protein. A protein analogous, therefore, to cooking and serving the things that have been specified by the bookmarks in the cookbook. And, of course, you can't just keep making a mess in the kitchen. You've got to clean up at some point. And cleaning up happens through protein degradation. It's a diffusive process where the proteins get either actively cut up or cut up by thermal agitation or whatever. And then they become, again, uh, raw materials for another round. So maybe that uh, uh, analogy can be helpful as we go on. So, Waddington uh, is so English, is it in the Anyway, uh, Waddington is a polymath, and I think quite a self confident individual. Anyway, he had a picture that is widely used as an analogy of uh, what happens when a stem cell differentiates. So he thought of it and projected the idea that there was some kind of a sloping landscape and that you had stem cells here, bone made in the bone marrow, and they would pop out and they would go down this landscape and they might fall into a local minimum characterized by as being a nerve cell or a muscle cell or a blood cell or whatever. <coughs> And the steering processes that would determine a cell's fate would be simply the pushing around up here that determined what uh, valley these things fell into. <coughs> uh, All right, so here is a picture of a distinguished gentleman. Um, how about going back up the hill? So it was not part of Waddington's picture that you could ever go back up the hill. But uh, 25 years ago or so forth, Harold Weintraub figured out a way to produce muscle cell and skin cell. So that's not exactly going up the hill, but that's going across in this metaphor that we have here, that would be like going across an island mountain pass and getting into uh, 
uh, a different cell type. And how did he do it? He took one particular transcription factor, of which there are many, 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 uh, but he took one particular one called myodine and uh, delivered myodine to the cells and showed that we got, in that way, a certain number of muscle cells. Reversing, in part at least, the Wyden picture. But then Yamanaka, in 2007, did his Nobel Prize winning work, which was to show he could take cells and push them all the way back to become stem cells. So this was a revolution. Um, these were, I think it's fair to say these discoveries were not very well understood. In fact, Yamanaka did a great deal of experimentation with transcription factors, and as I said, there was enough to make the problem, the problem quite challenging, or tedious at least, and he found a combination of four that would, in fact, push things back up the hill. What is our chances of really understanding these things? Well, so here's an article from this month from the scientist by a couple of Harvard people. I only quote it here to uh, emphasize that we're dealing with a complex system. 3,000 enzymes, nutrient transporters, etc., etc. Uh, are involved in everyday cellular life. Um, and that's only a small part of it. So, just throwing up as an example of uh, complexity, which you've probably seen in your life already, because many libraries, at least Harvard's library, had the picture of the Krebs cycle up on the wall between the first and second floor for generations. Uh, just to let you know that Biologists are pretty smart. Anyway, so that kind of complexity is repeated many times. So, you're not going to write differential equations for the first principles involved here. You're going to have to do something different. Okay, fortunately, there are new measurement techniques and all the measuring techniques at the um, scale that have become available and also uh, measuring techniques that are not necessarily small things but effectively creating uh, things like analogous to the microscopes that on uh, the interaction with the atoms. Um, So one of these ways that protein cells will prove to be uh, significant in one of this thing. Okay, another thing I've alluded to before is, again, an article that was recently published, but the idea is not so new. So these folks, there's quite a number of other authors in this case, um, generated high resolution, multi-organ expression, where they measured the temporal evolution of gene activity. So gene activity thinks, think about that original place where it talks about the kitchen analogy. So gene activity would be moving around of the paper clips on the pages of the DNA. So attaching, unattaching, so forth, of, um, as an example of gene activity. And what they showed was is that of the 3,000 genes that I put up and mentioned before, they said some um, the hair data between 40 and 60 percent of those be 
behave periodically. So here you have um, thousands of cycles. Now, these cycles don't forget that you're a electrical engineer, if that's the case uh, for a moment, because in electricity, you only have Coulombs. And all the Coulombs are the same. But in chemistry, and in particular in biochemistry, you have unbelievable diversity. So you have uh, chemical oscillations that can occur with all 3,000 species more or less independently. So you have potentially non-interacting, at first order, non-interacting periodic solutions uh, sitting there in the same uh, soup, so to speak. So <clears throat> things look complicated. So we would like to figure out, if possible, something further about the details of this thing so that we can uh, try to coordinate. What, what, how, how might we try to find out something? Well, if we could determine the period of these oscillations or replicate their shape, it might be possible to uh, be more specific about what was making a particular oscillation work. And if we could understand how these oscillations are synchronized and what they're synchronized to, that would, could potentially be helpful also. So here's a, an effort to dig deeper, just understand the oscillation. And the purpose of the oscillation you know, is not to write another paper about x double dot plus f of x equals zero. The purpose is to really determine something about the coefficients or the more detailed model of what makes this uh, system work. So, think the first order about a pair of variables. Think about the proteins that are generated. So that's ostensibly the purpose of the oscillation is to produce the proteins that the cell needs to do the rest of its work. In order to produce the protein, you've got to have the right transcription factor and sort of a presumed level of activity. So, these things are reasonably approximated by first order dynamics that look just like uh, so anything you get from diffusion or heat transfer or something like that. There are positive coefficients here, time constants. They, they just fall downhill like any thermal system would. And they come in pairs, the transcription factor and the protein it generates. So you can put these into a second order differential equation or a pair of couple of first order equations. And you can say to yourself, well, what do I need to add to that to make an oscillation? Is, so, I'm sorry, on that side, is, is, is beta zero the same thing as x? Or? There's a beta zero on the p dot equation. Should I think of that as x or some function of x? Or? Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> should, be, should be x. Oh, okay. it's the same. Yes. Uh, okay, so Alowitz and Lieber in uh, around 2000 uh, put together a story about how you can make oscillations of this kind. And um, showed that it was biologically relevant by actually building a artificial biological system that oscillated and the equations that I've written up here I will explain a little bit. Uh, so this first part here 
it's just the dynamics between what I called alpha zero before and the protein production. So this is protein one production. And over here is a nonlinear. But the key thing is that here is one and here's three. So we have three of these systems that are connected in a loop. And one drives the other, the other drives two, and then that drives three and back to one. And the signs are arranged in such a way as that um, they alternate repression and amplification. So if something gets too big, it gets repressed. If something isn't repressed, it grows. So that's, that is the basic idea behind these oscillators, which you might think of in engineering terms as something like a relaxation oscillation. Uh, the reason for this P and the gamma actually has a good chemical kinetic reason associated with it, which I won't go into, but that term is, uh, has some um, first principles basis. This, if you want to ever question about which accidents in life allow you to become famous, many people know that this is Hill's function. All right, so uh, I simulated those equations just to prove I could do it. And there's a response. Now, there's a couple of bad things about the solution to the repressor equation. A number of good things about it. One, it works. And that's a good thing. And uh, another thing is possible to relate the periods to things that you think you understand. So that's also a, a nice feature. But, Something to be said about this is that the oscillations are not periodic. They're not, they're not a sine wave plus a bias term or, or anything much like that. And so it's hard to go from those equations and determine the amplitude. It's not like harmonic balance does so nicely for many nonlinear systems. You don't have something like that here. And when it comes to synchronizing these with other systems of this like, you like to have a well-defined phase associated with this. And that's not so easy to define either because they're not scientific. But here's some experimental data from Roger Posky's lab um, showing uh, the protein generation curve, I guess is the blue curve, uh, measured from cells. Now, how, how do you do this? Well, it turns out that you can take cells, say a colony of cells, and reduce their input to nothing, practically, or at least a minimal level. So when they are starved in this way, they will not reproduce, so they will just sit there. Remember the cycle I showed, the circle I showed earlier on? So they'll sit there at a specific point on that circle, and then you give them some food, and they go. So then from the introduction of food point of view, you measure the protein output, and sure enough, it looks like the repressive equations these are two different proteins that you saw? I'm sorry? These are two different proteins you saw? No, this is a protein and a transcription factor. Okay, thank you. It's the pair, it's the PX pair. Okay. Now, you ask yourself why is this point on this curve not the high, as high as that? And I asked myself that, then I went to Indica and I asked him, and he explained to me a very simple explanation, namely, that, of course, this is from a colony of cells. And the, originally, for this first cycle, the colony is very well synchronized because 
to start with. But over the evolution of this, cells don't evolve according to Newton's second law. And by the time you get to the next cycle, they have become detuned. So they're not in synchrony anymore. So here's a problem for all of you who like to do statistical inference. Build a model for the mechanism of desynchronization. I think that's relatively easy. And then you would be able to generate curves like this that said how much lower would this be than that be? Because this really represents the sum of many <coughs> such oscillations, somewhat detuned. And then after you've got a parametrized model for the detuning process, you could use the full extent of this data to make a maximum likelihood estimate of what the constants are in that uh, repressed later equation. I don't, I don't think things like that have ever, have ever been done. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, what happens if you extend the data twice as long? You mean get more cycles? Yeah. If you get six cycles, it'll look worse. That is to say, this the peaks will be more spread out and less amplitude, etc. But you should understand that this data is obtained through one of the most expensive processes <laughs> and in the in the experimental world. So you don't do that cavalierly. <laughs> and uh, generally speaking, the data further out is more is less worthy, less useful than the data out close. That's a that's subjective that's government. That, that's a subject, subjective judgment that would need to be demonstrated, I think. Okay. So, does he have data where you have multiple transcription factors and multiple proteins? And what happens in that couple of them? I don't know. You should write and dig <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to suggest here is the general structure of the Ellis Lieber um, repressal labor equations. Their general structure is take a unit, take a unit, take a unit feedback and you get an oscillation. There's no reason, biologically or otherwise, not to think of this as part of a network. Just as we have mass spring system and single second order equation, but we also have networks of springs and masses and uh, generalized in that way. So if you wish to, you can make some uh, translation between these two pictures, the, well, how should I describe the degree of rever reverence that we have for x delta dot plus kx? I mean, it really just warms my heart to talk about it. <laughs> these equations also have some structure to them, and they're very nice, and you can um, take a shot at the natural frequency of the repressor equation by doing some little analysis like this. It involves <coughs> higher order polynomial, but that's nothing for MATLAB. There's no reason for a single loop. It can be a mesh. So if you've got that enough. Okay. Um, Our bodies have a uh, <coughs> clock, and from that clock there descends a whole bunch of trees down to the heavy organ also. Uh, it has been observed that many organs have also clocks that are somehow entrained to the um, main clock, which is itself uh, in direct 
contact with our uh, optic nerve, which uh, is responsive to sunlight. So these things have a period that somehow descends from the daily cycle, circadian rhythm, but we need to ask ourselves questions like, what is the simplest mechanism by which we can synchronize a system to an external system without drawing power from that external system? So, I mean, everybody, many people have done experiments where you shake something and then you see the things inside shaking at the same frequency as the things shaking them. Okay? That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is that you have an external signal which, from which you cannot draw energy. There's no mechanism to draw energy from it. But you can, in fact, attempt to set the natural frequency. And I've shown it here as a second order system. Just Forgive me, I only did that because you're probably tired of seeing the repressed later equations already. All right? So, I'm just saying you can, in fact, adjust the natural frequency by means of a simple rule, like here, uh, which will then take the external signal, in this case the sines and cosines, and adjust beta in such a way as to make the natural frequency of this match that. I'm not going to go through any details of that because all the work beautiful. Just because it doesn't play that big a role in what I'm saying. It's just there's all these oscillations going around. There are a few organizational principles that seem to apply to them. This is showing how beta evolves as a function of time under this rule. So I think I'm doing fine in terms of time. Um, so you're given a very high dimensional system, thousands, and you don't know very much about the underlying chemistry, physics, biology that makes it work. What can you do to try to figure out how to do the U's, which are the transcription factors that Weintraub and Yamanaka use so effectively? How can you make a science out of choosing these optimally? For example, if you wanted to use reprogramming to grow skin cells turn skin cells into a bone cell, say, you wouldn't want the poor injured person to sit there for five years making a couple cells a day. You would want this process to be as efficient as possible. And that means you would like to understand it so that you could optimize the timing and the delivery of the transcription factors um, to make it happen. So, if you're up against a very complicated system, one of the things you can do is you can look at the equilibrium states. <coughs> and from the equilibrium states, namely the solutions of f of x and u equals 0, you can get some information about u, about f. <coughs> so, in particular, here's what you can learn about f if you are able to observe something about the system. I mean, it's important that um, point out is obvious that you can't see all of x, you can only see a part. So with this kind of way you could get a crude approximation short of trying to identify the whole complicated system. Putting that in more concrete form. But this idea, which is perfectly good one, it accounts for a lot of what we know about some processes doesn't really help us here because the steady state solution isn't a constant. The steady state solution is an oscillation. So now, 
I'm throwing out as a problem for people who don't have anything else to do with their lives, is if you said, the steady states are oscillations, and I want you to use the same kind of technique, except I don't want it to be about equilibrium points, I want it to be about steady state oscillations. Okay. That's not what was done in this project. What was done in the project was to say, all right, now, steady state is not going to be enough for our purposes. Let's take some more points and see if we can get some kind of uh, description of the time evolution. So as soon as you take that point of view, you ask yourself, the time evolution of what? The time evolution of 3,000 variables? I don't think so. Um, what can we do to simultaneously simplify the model and uh, make it a time evolution statement? Okay, so I, I don't know exactly. In this paper here, the following idea is advanced. This is a very long list of authors here. Um, following idea is suggested. Namely, there seems to be a non-uniformity in the activity that goes along with the DNA, for example, the long periods of the DNA sequence, which is not, doesn't code for proteins, and hence doesn't seem to play, uh, well, at this point, plays an unknown role in what DNA is good for. But there are other places where there are activity centers. And by um, DNA sequencing, you can identify these activity centers. And in this work, there was discussed the idea of topologically associated domains. That is, short strings, shorter strings of DNA, which seem to somehow act in unison. What is meant by function? What do you say, single function? Single function. Oh, they act together. In, they're active at the same time. Well, <coughs> I think it's they. They seem to activate together. <coughs> so, I, with, with uh, DNA sequencing, I think, uh, in, in Vigo's lab, they found something like 700 of these <coughs> topologically associated domains. And from those, there were some that were more powerful than others. And they, uh, a subset of those, a small subset, was selected. And <coughs> they were used. I'll, I'll get to build a kind of evolution model, but not what you might think of as the state of the system involved. Because first of all, you don't really care about the state. Because going back to Waddington, what you care about is the domain of attraction of those valleys. But unlike what Walt Waddington suggested, what's at the bottom of the valley is not an equilibrium point, but it's an oscillation. So what you would like to do is to steer the system from one oscillatory state to another one. This is rather different than you might imagine, because you don't know the initial condition or under some circumstances, you might know the initial condition from where you're coming, but you certainly don't care <coughs> about what phase you hit the final valley. You just want to get into that valley. So this is what the controllability problem looks like. <coughs> it's fair to call this data guided for the following reason. First of all, 
the domain, the topologically associated domains, were determined from the end. And secondly, looking at the evolution of how the transcription factors steer you, steer that vector around, it's a linear system, it's a system identification problem. Children said it were linear. System identification problem. And you do it by experimentation methods. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, you've made <coughs> experiments to see, as you would if you were trying to numerically determine the first derivative. So anyway, that is the that is the state of the identification problem. And I'm not going to talk to you about the experiments because it's not my thing. Um, and I'll end with just this slide. Namely, system identification after a severe dimension reduction process and together with some simulation uh, made it possible to identify the transcription factors that Kalanaka used and some other ones that was also that can also be used and seem to be effective. And uh, that's the accomplishment of data-guided controllability of the genome. Thank you.
So, sounds more like an editorial. Go ahead. Second question is this. Uh, in cancer, and many of the cells, right? Uh, Barmus actually basically in his theory he studied virus aspects of cancer and the conclusion is which I believe also is that cancer is actually an immune system disease and many things happen because of uh, some malfunction of the signal in the cells. Right? So in your theory, if we think of cells and we have signal in the case, you talked about it, but the one what about the communication between the cells, especially if you try to put them on the graph. And what happens is there are so many factors that they can change the signal in, that they can change the internal processing of the cells. Has there been any effort to identify this kind of mechanism in this context as far as whether the signal is how they affect the situations or not? Even in the control environment? <coughs> uh, Dr. Reed and I, other, another group have been developing a story in which WNT signaling okay. plays a central role. Right. And this is you plan to incorporate that here or? Well, actually until yesterday morning uh, I thought I would, but, but then life intervened. Mm -hmm. but, but but you still want to, right? Because yeah, and I if you have a couple of oscillations and you move it out then the signal is from also play a role. I think there's something interesting system theoretically that one can say there. And you have done this experiment? <laughs> well, the, 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 the wind signaling does not primarily affect the communication between cells, but it affects one cell because it turns on the questions. Um, the, the other um, fundamental difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell is for Dr. Parker showed DNA sequence. That's the, the, one of the first and the most pronounced difference between the cancer cell and the cancer In addition, there are epigenetic modifications as well, um, but uh, there is no cancer cell that has the longer um, number of concepts. Okay, so we can talk about your question. Roger, so um, what do you think about doing this whole thing in discrete time? Because eventually you're gonna deal with a lot of dimension reduction, right? And you know, recently the dimension reduction, you know, tools in discrete time have been advanced much more than in continuous time. So what do you, what do you think we've been doing this whole thing in discrete? Gosh, you know, I had to bite my tongue throughout your thesis. <laughs> get you guys to stop making that distinction. Come on. <laughs> you know, we don't really have a need to distinguish from continuous time and discrete time. Whatever's the easiest to write down, write it down. So I I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> question. Sure so, it's a historical sort of question. So in your talk, a couple of different places you brought up Waddington, and who had played an influential role in the context of the name Tom and other people thinking about clouds and mathematics <coughs> together. So but at that time, it seemed to be mainly about how form arises through some sort of traveling a, a by gradient flow on an epigenetic landscape, if I remember right, the 1973 <coughs> But in the present context, you seem to have updated it to talk about landing on domains of attraction for oscillations. Is that, and then, in addition, being able to bounce from one such domain to the other, or in a controlled way from one to the other. I mean, is that, was that at all present in the earlier work, or in the oscillations? Um, you know. It sounds like you know more about this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was, in, in, our, in, in some of our graduate student lives, we read the spectral stability and morphogenesis, so that was the influence I'm, I still feel. Uh, right, but it seemed to me that 
Rene Tom was trying to do anything to make the theory of catastrophes look good. And, <laughs> and, and oscillations play almost no role. Yeah, so, yeah. I, thought so, I don't know if you answered your question. So I have one more question and it's related to your question. So, you know all this stuff about uh, some of the stuff about mean field theory and all that kind of stuff. About mean field theory and all that. Okay. Yeah. The version of mean field theory okay. that I'm referring to is the one where you have say, a single differential equation, a stochastic differential equation, that would be something like a single cell, and that is influenced by some function out of the probability distribution of the ensemble. Uh -huh. So this is the serious version of mean field theory. It started from the theory of the and so forth. Do you think there is any chance that to do this thing where you isolate the cell and try to understand what's happening to that cell as it is in the entire population? Or is that completely irrelevant? I don't. That's for both of you. Well, my advice would be yes. to get lucky, find yourself part of a team of people who actually know biology, and then be on the lookout for things you find interesting. I, I, I think some students, Rosetta, but what scares me with biology and I close with that is that in our field, when you make a mistake, it takes a week to correct it in biology, it takes at least six months for you to do the experiment. <laughs> 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 I worked with my, with my older son in this regard and I was admiring the character of you know, one, one particular experiment. And you know, it goes wrong. Some do contamination, some do have to redo it. Okay. Anyway, any other questions? So, Rosetta will be here two days. His office is next door to me. If you know how to find me, if you don't know how to find me, he's on A.B. Williams like that. He's a pillar. Right? So this, as you look at the pillar in the right wing, close to the corner, close to Christmas office. And anyway, if you don't know where to find him, go to Kim and you will find him. He will be here until about tomorrow afternoon, early around 3 or 4 o'clock. And it will be tomorrow. Where is the room for the round table? is in room 1146. Downstairs, the ISR conference. So you are welcome to come. We're going to have more discussions on that, and it's free for all. Very informal. We don't have any formal. Listen. <laughs>